So folks understand uh, the challenges that uh, exist uh, for African-American boys. But they get frustrated, I think, if they feel that there's no context for it. Uh, or, and that context is being denied. Uh, and, uh, and that all contributes, I think, to a sense that uh, if a white male teen was involved in the same kind of scenario that from top to bottom uh, both the outcome uh, and the aftermath might have been different. That was just a little bit more of President Obama's unexpected and deeply personal remarks given yesterday in the White House briefing room. Tim, what are the primary <clears throat> barriers to having the kind of conversations that the president was calling for yesterday? Well, I can only speak to the barriers for white folks because yep. that's my people. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, I, and, 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 and me and Chris Matthews, we speak for all yes, white folks. Right, right. Yes, you do. Chris so, was on uh, fire this week, wasn't right. he? So, so, no, but here, here's the thing. You know, I think one of the barriers is that we're not willing to reflect on our own experience. Mm -hmm. Even when we talk about racism, we talk about it as a black issue, as a Latino mm -hmm. issue. Here's the reality. We have to be honest that what the president just said about it might have been different. Well, I can tell you it would have been different, and I can tell you from my own experience. So in New Orleans, I'm 23. I had just graduated from Tulane. You will either appreciate this or recognize the story, at yes. least being in New Orleans. Um, I was out. I locked myself out of my car. Had to get a coat hanger to break in. Keys are in there. I'm out there. I'm in a T-shirt, cut off shorts, mm -hmm. flip flops or what. I'm trying to break in with a coat hanger. NOPD, New Orleans police officer, comes up, sees me trying to break into a vehicle that he does not know is my vehicle. Mm -hmm. He does not ask me for a license. He does not ask me for proof that it's my car. In fact, he proceeds to say, you're doing that wrong. Son, let me I help said you. what he did. He said, you're breaking into that car the wrong way. Let me show you the right way. So he then proceeds to try to get in. He couldn't because apparently the 1988 Toyota Tercel is the hardest car in the world to steal. <laughs> Not that anybody would want one, but very hard to steal. So he then looks at me and says, you know, we ought to just throw a brick through it. So I have a police officer offering to help me, as far as he knows, steal a vehicle. Now, anyone who thinks that a 23-year-old black male in New Orleans or anywhere else in this country would have had that experience yeah. is so deluded that we cannot have a conversation about probably anything like the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, <laughs> because that is just so obvious. So yep. that is, we can't just talk about the mm -hmm. downside of racism for those of color, which is quite real. And we've got to be but open to it. We've got to talk about the advantage, the upside mm -hmm. for people who don't have to yes. ever ask themselves, could I have been that young right. man? Right. Because this, we wouldn't be. This is the it, this is the if if President Obama can say I, Trayvon Martin could have been me. This is the point that that in fact Trayvon Martin could. I am not Trayvon Martin if right. I am in another kind of body. Right. George Zimmerman right. could have been me. And so, right. Or a lot of other white folks. Yep. And I want to add to this point because it has really deep historical roots. Mm -hmm. So the president makes reference in this speech to statistically Trayvon Martin was more likely to be killed by a peer than by George Zimmerman, which is his way of sort of grounding it in a way that he doesn't go too far off the mm -hmm. reservation, right? But the, the, the larger history that this relies upon is essentially that statistically, Trayvon's not likely to be the president. So statistically, mm -hmm. we should treat Trayvon like the potential suspect mm -hmm. that he is rather than him being like the president. And essentially, the violence of the racial quantification of black life, yes. this way in which we essentially yes. say we don't have to use the N-word anymore. Yep, yep. All we have to simply say is young, black, male, 14 to 21, yep. likely suspect, and then craft a whole set of policies around that to statistically predict that most of them are likely well, to be right, in trouble, right. so not likely to be president. Well, and the, and the, other, right. the other side of the story, and, and, and this is the part, so it, it is true that statistically he is more likely to have been shot by a peer. It's also, however, statistically likely, much more likely that George Zimmerman would have been shot by a peer. Right. Violence right. is intraracial right. for all, intra. R A for for all groups, right? So so the violence against white people is typically right. white on white violence. That's right. But the history, but well, here's where the history yep. matters. So a hundred years ago, those statistics really didn't exist. Yeah. So the statistics come into use a hundred years ago to separate out mm. deserving and undeserving, yep. worthy and unworthy. And essentially, a hundred years ago, one of the leading racial demographers in America said, when black men come into competition with white men, they have two roads out of their dilemma: the road to prison or the road to an early grave. Mm -hmm. 1896. So in in other words, we have set up history. So when President Obama talks about history, yeah. a history we don't know very well, right. essentially we have stacked the deck yep, right. to end up with statistical proof yes. to reinforce a lie from the very beginning that black men are likely to end up in prison or dead. And so why should we bother creating pathways of opportunity for, for them else. to be president? Senator Turner, I want, I want to read quickly what 
uh, Trayvon Martin's parents said in response okay. to President Obama. And then have you have you play off of that and also anything else here? Let's just take a, a look for a moment because um, they wrote President Obama sees himself in Trayvon and identifies with him. This is a beautiful tribute to our boy. Mm -hmm. Trayvon's life was cut short, but we hope that his legacy will make our communities a better place for generations to come. We applaud the president's call to action to bring communities together and encourage an open and difficult dialogue. And, and that's what it's going to take. But the pain of losing a child then to have to go out on public display and grieve and then to say what the president has said about our son is a tribute. I wish that Trayvon Martin was alive so that that tribute could be given to him. You know, and even on the cover of the Daily News right here, I mean, to see the juxtaposition of yes. the president, yes. the young Barack Obama next to Trayvon Martin. And, and Drudge made a picture. I mean, put, so Drudge immediately last night yes. made an image where they put young President Obama's face onto on to Trayvon Martin in that, in with, that hoodie, hoodie picture. Mm -hmm. but, but, but a point I want to follow up, remember Ice Cube had some lyrics that said, my skin is my sin. Mm -hmm. and we, we need to understand that. And to Tim's point, dealing with racism or bigotry or, or we, see, we've all been socialized, whether we're black, white, Latino, Asian, it doesn't matter what our ethnicity, we have all been socialized in a society that says that black life is less. And not only does it say it, it follows it through in laws in this country, it follows it through in deeds. Mm -hmm. So what Ice Cube had to say, there's something profound and eerie about saying to the world, my skin is my sin. Right. We got to deal with that. Right. Just existing. Just in this existing. Way. Stick with us. We're going to come back because I also want to talk about just how extraordinary the moment in the White House briefing room was in the first place. We come back. That's so, that's so disappointing, man. Jay, is this kind of the kind of respect that you get? That was President Obama surprising the White House press corps yesterday when he suddenly emerged to talk about Trayvon Martin and race. So surprising that, in fact, if you look at the transcript of the remarks on the Washington Post website, the very first word of the transcript is from reporters in the briefing room simply saying, whoa, the White House press corps didn't see this coming. It was unannounced and apparently unscripted. The president so caught us all off guard. So what led up to this? What happened nearly a week after the verdict in the trial of George Zimmerman that spurred President Obama to speak at length about race in America at that particular moment? And for that answer, we go to the White House and NBC's Kristen Walker. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Melissa. You know, I think this president is so deliberative, as you know. Uh, and so he, according to White House officials, has been watching, carefully watching and monitoring the reaction to the George Zimmerman verdict ever since it came down last weekend, both within the African-American community, but also sort of throughout the country. And because there were such strong emotions on both sides, he felt the need to speak out as the nation's first African-American president. This is a decision that he decided discussed with his family. And then I'm told that on Thursday, he called senior advisors uh, into his office and he told them this is what he was thinking of doing. Some of them were skeptical, I am told. But once he talked about his thoughts and what he wanted to say to the nation, uh, there was sort of a unanimous agreement that he should, in fact, address the nation. So that is what happened on Friday. You talked about the element of surprise, Melissa. That was by design. The president wanted this to be unscripted. Uh, and the White House didn't want reporters sitting around thinking about what he was going to say and start to speculate about what he was going to say. They wanted the focus to be on his remarks. And that's really what happened. And I can tell you it was so striking. I've covered this beat for more than two years. We usually do get a heads up. This is the first time that we didn't. So it really was stunning for that reason. But also, Melissa, because he was so personal. Uh, he talked about the fact that uh, he could have been Trayvon Martin 35 years ago, as you've been discussing throughout your show. Uh, it was really, to some extent, a bookend to the yep. speech that he gave back in 2008 when he was a candidate. But this was uh, a very different tone. As a president, I think he was more deeply personal uh, and freer with you his know, thoughts. It's so funny that, that you say that about, um, that, that maybe it was about making sure that reporters weren't sort of overthinking it um, before yeah. it happened. Because, you know, we were all sitting around upstairs in Nerdland 
prepping for today's show. <laughs> and, and one of the producers said, oh, you know, president's on. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe he's going to talk about Detroit. And then when he said, I'm here to talk about Trayvon Martin, I just, I mean, we were, we were all just speechless in that moment. So I think that that is exactly what happened here at the White House. When we saw him come out, we immediately started to say, well, what is he going to talk about? It must be Detroit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people thought that this White House had moved on from the issue of Trayvon Martin because, remember, he did release a paper statement last week. He yep. called for national calm in the wake of this verdict, which, by the way, uh, both in his written statement and in his remarks yesterday, uh, he said that the nation should respect the verdict and said that the judge had handled uh, the case professionally. But I think you're absolutely right. The fact that he started speaking about Trayvon Martin, no one yes. saw it come and it really uh, allowed the nation to focus, yep. I think, on his words and, and to really listen to what he was saying. I think it was a message uh, to the African-American community, but really to all Americans to say, you know, this reaction that we are seeing comes within uh, a, an historic context that we need to remember is not going away. And I think that that was sort of the power of his remarks and also uh, his call to action moving forward in terms of restarting a national conversation uh, about race relations. It, it, it